This episode is supported by Battlefilm.com. And remember to join us for Wild West Exit this week, starting October 2nd. Anime cyberpunk style meets skirmish combat in Infinity. Experience eight high-tech factions and fight to control the human sphere at the Infinity Hub on BeastsOfWar.com. Good morning, welcome to the weekend, and look at that happy face! He's frozen. No. Ben, ben is happy to be here. Are you? Um, ben has got a chance to have a, um, a hook about yeah. uh, the Season of War Firestorm campaign mm-hmm. for Age of Sigmar. Ben, what do you think of it, mate? Uh, yeah, so it was pretty good. Uh, so we got an article up, uh, that's sort of like a little bit of a what's inside the box uh, for this, so you can go and check it out there and see what I think of it. But yeah, as it stands so far, this seems like it's a pretty awesome step in the right direction when it comes from Games Workshop. Uh, they've done a really nice job on this as a campaign system mm-hmm. that you sit down and play with a couple of friends over a sort of six to eight week period, which is pretty cool. It's got really nice components thrown into the mix. The artwork is absolutely amazing. Uh, and it really helps in the sort of uh, the sense of world building that Games Workshop have been going for at the moment for Age of Sigmar. And they've been doing that very much so with a lot of the stuff they did in General's Handbook 2 and a lot of the source books for the factions as well. And it feels like this is almost like a little bit of a, a conglomeration of a whole bunch of different things they were trying to do with that General's Handbook in oh. this uh, new campaign box. It's just stunning. Look at yeah, it, the, yeah. See this floating island thing? Mm. Um, I was chatting to Lloyd uh, in the studio recently about um, we have a couple of terrain projects in the mix oh, that, we, okay. that we want to be getting to. One is uh, we, we've got Kattegat for the Vikings. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And in November. Probably November yeah. we'll, be, we'll be doing that. But I was saying to Lloyd, you know, Lloyd, I'd really like to free you up to get you to do a bit of terrain building. Yeah. If you could pick anything, what, 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 what would you fancy doing? He says, actually, I want to take my sponge technique and I want to do the inverted floating islands. Oh. Well, didn't to we, do we've already tried that the once mm-hmm. with Polistari. Yes. But he actually wants to do it from start to finish wow. with lava and all of that kind of stuff going on. So, yeah, if you'd like to see Lloydy do that, yeah, how many, get how, in the comments. How many say, comments do we need to give Lloydy to do that? I yeah. wonder how many comments we need to get. Lloydy, just do it. Lloydy, make it happen. <laughs> I want it to happen too. So get some comments in there and then we can press his nose to the screen and go, look, Lloydy, all the adoring gamers out there. They want you, Lloydy. They want you. They want to see your lava spilling over the table so <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah that didn't come out just quite as i expected I, it okay anyway this? Uh, uh, anyway what is it for for the for those of us that uh, have just looked at the pretty pictures and said yeah ben likes it it looks awesome but what the hell is it what is it yeah so firestorm is effectively a campaign system that you can play out with your friends as i said you play it over, out over sort of six to eight weeks it's based around the moments after the sort of big realm gate wars and stuff so this is where sigmar set up his mighty city of hammerhall and it uh, spreads over two realms both the realm of fire and the realm of life and this is his campaign or your campaign that you play out for the realm of fire to conquer this place called the flame scar peninsula and so you'll be playing as the forces of order destruction death and chaos and you'll each be trying to vie for control of this with uh, really cool sticker packs and stuff that stick things down. You'll be building your uh, your civilization and your sort of uh, your towns and cities up as you go around the board, and obviously finding out lots and lots of interesting narrative battles at the same time. As well. And that was the big thing for me: the stickers and the there's envelopes with it as well, Ben. Is that right? To kind of yeah, add so, to this legacy element. Yeah. So the envelopes are actually there for the each of the different um, sort of people involved in the campaign to have all their stuff sort of stored away. It's almost like a little bit of a save system. Mm -hmm. But the legacy system comes in in the fact that once you've finished your sort of campaign of uh, Firestorm, they encourage you to go back to it and play it again on the map you've created. A little bit like what they did with Risk Legacy, uh, which was that sort of concept um, to it. So yeah, that's the kind of thing. So you come back and you fight for the the realm of Flamescar uh, Plateau over again, which I thought was pretty cool. But so, yeah, so this is not a one trick pony. You can it is a, it is like a legacy system, but you can yeah. do it over and over again, and they actually encourage that. That's really cool, actually. And one of the big things as well is those stickers. They actually are sort of peel offable. So once you put them on the board, you can move them around. Peel so off, peel uh, they can stick down and be and be moved around and sort of shifted. So as things are changing and people are taking over different regions and stuff, you can sort of move the stickers around and stuff, which I thought was really cool and adds to that reusability of things uh, when it comes to the game. That is actually a really big thing because I was really concerned, not concerned, I was excited, but also concerned that once you'd used it once, that would be it done. Yeah. Um, and I kind of 
six week or six kind of battle long campaign. I was like, really? But the fact that you can reuse it, redo it, go back in, take it off, you're what, what, what? Are you? I'm such a flipping man child. What? Because at the moment he mentioned stickers, I was sold. <laughs> I can't just let them think of, I'm as bad as my kids. It's just, there's stickers? What? There's stickers? And then when I saw the stickers, I was going, no, we see. Oh, they are really cool if, stickers. If you were in my campaign, I would wreck you. Because you have to play a battle before you get your allocation of stickers. Oh, no. If you don't play a battle, just, you can't have your little stickers for that, that part of the campaign. Stickers, no. man. Stickers. And have each envelope separated out with your reward for each battle that you play. <laughs> um, are we are we going to try and get a game of it in, Ben, so as we can get... Uh, are you, can you g- gather up some uh, other... <laughs> what, what, what do you call a Birmingham dude? What are, what are you guys <laughs> called over there? Brummies. Brummies. Can you get some Brummies together and give us a the Brummie take? I know I know that we're looking to get some of the community members who do some stuff for us to hopefully get hold of it, have yeah. a couple of games. Oh, you've got us. this in hand, yeah, have yeah. you? So All hopefully right. maybe get a bit of a battle report, a bit of a summary of what the guys thought as they and, and a bit of an overview of what their campaign is like. So we'll hopefully bring that in the next few weeks. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. Um, right, next up, uh, uh, Bullsong Boot Camp winners, mm. uh, the competition. But before we get to that, I have an important announcement to make. Okay. Okay. My buddy, Bob Cocaine, Bob Cocaine, 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 Bob Cocaine, Cocaine, um, was telling me um, about his mate Kevin, mm. and his exact words to me is, "Kevin is a cheap ass kid who hasn't joined backstage yet, but has to." <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, so Kevin, I'm to point at you and go, "Kevin, you're a cheap ass kid, and you have to join backstage." But I'll go one better, Kevin. Okay. I'll be waiting for you tomorrow morning in backstage with the biggest virtual man hug you've ever got. So, uh, Kevin, Bob says, come join backstage and I'll be there waiting for you. <laughs> to, to the thousands of you out there, that's just for one. This yeah, is, no, normally anybody, we speak to everyone, but this yeah, is just, uh, this just, is just for you, Kevin. Kevin. Yeah. This, is, this is just for you, man. It's one time. Uh, and, and if anybody's curious, you can join backstage as well and see Hold what on. happens so tomorrow we, with my virtual man hug for we, Kevin. Could we get a, a viewer's meal? Do you want to set, Do you want Beast of War to read your messages out? I think we can open this up. This could be a segment. Well, we'll, we'll Send see. Send Warzan what you want him to read. Yeah, <laughs> preferably if it's embarrassing your friends into joining backstage. That's awesome. That's the best kind of mail right there. <laughs> or find the, the, the best, worst novel you can and have him read a passage. Oh. In my in my best novella voice. Yes. I'll do my best. I'll do my best voice acting on it. So I will. I love it. Love yes, it. All right, every, every page will be out of Fifty Shades of Grey or something, <laughs> won't it? You just know it. So it's uh... anyway. So before we move, I'm on... sick that week. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm sick that year. Kevin, I'm I'm waiting for you, man. I'm waiting for you. See you tomorrow morning, dude. See you then. <laughs> okay. I hope you don't get stood up. <laughs> it's going to be highly embarrassing if I do. So. <laughs> I will hold you responsible, Bob. <laughs> um, right. We have an ongoing competition at the yep. moment where we are giving away uh, three two-player starter bundles yes. um, for a Volsung. Um, if you want to get into that, um, head on over to beastofwar.com and somewhere there on the homepage mm-hmm. um, will be uh, the link to the boot camp weekend. So if you've ever fancied getting into well, it's a fantastic narrative steampunk, steampunk fun game. Fun adventure. Yeah, um, it's just... uh, go and check out uh, the, the live blog from the weekend. You will learn loads. Uh, drop your sprinkling of comments in there. Mm-hmm. And then next week, we'll be announcing uh, the three winners. From the Friday blog, the Saturday blog, mm-hmm. and the Sunday blog. So if you want to stick your name in each one, and let us know what you're thinking about the game, please do. Yeah, and then what's in each bundle is two one-player starter sets of your choice, the rules, the dice, and the cards you need to play. Yeah. You'll love it. Okay. Um, next up, Hobby God Bag Winner. Right, so we do this thing yep. called Hobby Night Live. Um, the whole purpose of Hobby Night Live, if you haven't joined us, is it's a live event that we do approximately once a month. Um, and the whole the whole thing is to be there for one another to get in and do some hobby. And that hobby could be anything. We've seen, we've seen a big variation. Yeah, and it's a more varied, it, it is the better. It could be. Uh, <laughs> don't even go there, man. Don't well, even I, I, go I actually there. got the most lovely message from that guy apologizing for breaking you. Well, well that's good because I, I, it probably came in after I sent him in a message apologizing for being broken. They broke me. 
<laughs> so yes, we do terrain pieces, we do minis, we do big scale, we do small scale, we do every different yeah. game type you can imagine. Do you know what I would like to? Uh, I'd like to get in the mix mm -hmm. um, for some of you guys out there who are just into your meta. If you want to design an army list, and you would like for us to have a quick mm. chat about an army list or a scenario, or a scenario, or a story, or a story. Yeah, you know, the, hub, the whole the whole purpose of Hobby Night Live is it's a, it's a kickoff point. It happens mm. on a Friday night. We all get together um, and we're basically just moving a hobby forward mm -hmm. in some way. And for me, hobby is a very broad church. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, so much as there's a lot of talk of you know showing off the painting, the terrain making, and everything else, um, I don't want to uh, to. Uh, I'd like to open it up even further. Yeah. So if your hobby is you know I, you know, I fancy doing a bit of meta tonight, mm -hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna come up with a new army list. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see it. Okay. Um, if you want to come up with like a, a short story or a sexy poem, I'd love to see it. I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure. And for many of us, it, you might find that your hobby is just having a chat with all of the people yep. in the various Absolutely. chat rooms that we aggregate mm -hmm. on, the, on the Hobby Night Live. So, but the most important thing of Hobby Night Live is the hobby god. Mm -hmm. And he's, the, the hobby god is picked, he or she is picked. Uh, a couple of weeks later, because we, you know, you get started, you get fired up on Hobby Night Live, but then mm -hmm. you just keep going, and this is it. We're going to announce our latest hobby. Gone. And the key thing is that that vlog, that blog, it continues, it goes, it grows. It doesn't just that start finish, start that night, oh, or that weekend. It goes on for weeks, and you then review it later on. So mm -hmm. we like to see the growing. This is Warren's it. all about the growth. You know, he's this all about the. Is the hobby god bag? No one gets a hobby god bag. Unless they are a true hobby god. This is just awesome. Look at that there. Hold up the hobby god bag. Show reverence, boys, to the hobby god. Oh. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> so, um, Ben, talk yeah. us through who is this week's hobby god. Okay, so the hobby god uh, from the last show, I've decided to give it to Yanis1004 for his amazing oh. looking Vitrix Roman regiment. Now, Yanis has been uh, actually working on this for quite a few Hobby Night Lives, which I thought was really cool. And it's almost been this continuing project. Regiments, and it looks absolutely stunning. And now I'm a big fan of these kind of Romans anyway, uh, but to actually see these properly all painted up nicely in a really nice regimental fashion with amazing basing as well at the same time was just superb. And they look absolutely amazing. And congratulations, dude. So, yeah. Very cool. Oh, they are beautiful. Just look at the shield work. But what I specifically love about this, look at the the very, very um, elegantly done weathering at the bottom of the shields. Mm. Yeah. That's the little touch that, that brings this into Hobby yeah. God bag territory for me because it's, it's even the little bits of scars and damage that each individual shield has. Yeah. You know, it's all individualized. The other thing is the basing. Okay. That's worth for now, me. Yeah. This is this is where I need my buddy Calidors from the, the <laughs> What Are You Painting Now thread. Because Calidors is uh, he's a basing genius himself, okay? <laughs> but I think he'll agree with me. If I point out on this particular basing, it's the rock and it's the proximity of the grass tufts to the rock. The, the, it, because it's where you would expect to find grass tuf yeah. tufts where there's a little bit of shade mm -hmm. and, a, and a little bit of extra moisture that's trapped. And that's where you would expect to find that little bit of growth. Mm -hmm. You'll always wow. find a bit more tufty growth where it's moist. Mm. And that just about nails it right mm. there. Isn't so that fantastic? This is what you and me noticed whenever we were across in the south of France was mm. the difference in the actual ground. I mean, yes. You walk out into a field here, it's just a sheet of green. South of France, it's all just very little, arid tiny bits and of tiny tops. little yeah. bits of grass. There's here no and there. big wide surfaces of top no, at no, all. No, no, it no. is tiny tops. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So, but it, you know, it's a hotter climate. Mm -hmm. It's a hotter climate, so yeah. that kind of thing is what you would expect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, perfect. Love it. Absolutely, the Hobby God bag is on its way to you, Janus. Actually, it reminds uh, me of probably Janus, not Janus. Sorry, Janus. Pardon me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for calling me up on that one, Justin. Um, I've had a few people say yeah. that you constantly pronounce their names wrong. Yes, I butcher everybody's name. It's what I <laughs> do. He's consistent, though. If he starts getting some names right, then that's going to screw the whole thing up. He has yeah, to get them all okay, wrong. Okay, okay. You're going to breed jealousy within the community now. Okay, okay? sorry. So, <laughs> right. 
Thanks, Dustin. Anyway, <laughs> I was watching a very interesting thing recently, which was about gladiators. Right. Because okay? whenever, whenever Warren says that sentence, I'll talk to you guys directly. And yeah, I've been watching an interesting thing. You just, you just don't know. You just don't know. <laughs> okay. what, I, I was watching a thing about um, uh, sort of uh, five really famous gladiators, mm -hmm. okay? Lightning, I, Wolf. Yeah, I can't remember any of their <laughs> fucking names. But they do have names. I just don't remember any of their names. But there was one dude, okay, um, and he defeated 200 wild animals in one day. Right? Where are these now, bunnies? No, Hold on. no. This, this dude, these dudes, Justin, were terrifying. Right? I mean, like, there was one. There was one gladiator. I'm so annoyed. I don't remember their names. I will call him Maximus. I can hear <laughs> say. Maximus um, was uh, went into the gladiatorial ring as a newbie, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And went up against um, uh, Maximus. Was also a free man. Okay, which was highly unusual mm. for the gladiatorial. Um, uh, fighters. So, but he was uh, he went in as a free man. They they suspect he maybe came out of the army or something like that, and just wanted to be a gladiator. Was he perhaps so, a former general? This Maximus. Most no 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 no. Most of the gladiators by this point uh, or at this point were all kind of uh, slaves, mm -hmm. and they were fighting. And if they uh, they could win this wooden sword, which yeah. granted them their freemanship, and they'd yeah, yeah. be free. Um, there was one gladiator, he was a Syrian, okay? And the Syrians at that point were considered um, um, cowardly. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and he turned down the sword four times. He was so epic. Um, his name was Flanimal. <laughs> and, and he was so, <laughs> he was so epic, okay, mm. um, that he became a completely famous gladiator and he turned the sword down four times. Yeah, but um, here's the thing. If they're giving you this, this wooden gladius to set you free mm -hmm. and all you have known is fighting in the arena, do you really think you're going to walk out and get a job? Well, let's describe the arena. And that brings me nicely back to my, po my point, okay? So what they used to do is they used to starve wild animals, yep. okay? So lions, mm -hmm. and none of your wimpy, shitty lions that we have today. <laughs> These are proper, big, beastly, <laughs> terrifying lions, okay? These are <laughs> kind of lions. Bears, Justin, mm -hmm. and you know I don't like bears. Especially polar bears. You don't like bears. Don't what like do you polar know? Bears. What have you got polar against polar bears? Polar bears are the scariest animals. They're scarier to me than a mammoth is to you. Is it because they move through water so fast? No. Is no. it because they're camouflaged? No. No. I think it's something to do with the fact that their teeth and they, they just rip you to pieces. It's very, very scary. Elephants. Uh, there, in fact, there's there's drawings. Do you know the way the Romans drew what? on walls? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's a drawing on a wall of a gladiatorial scene where they have cut the trunk off an elephant. And there's a trunk lying, and there's an elephant with blood gushing out of the stump of where his trunk was. Right. Rhinos. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, basically, I don't know if there was ever giraffes. I'm not sure if you would I, find I, a giraffe. I doubt if you would find a vicious, vicious giraffe. I don't oh, know. You starve one. I don't know. You know I would say a giraffe would be a dangerous enough thing. But anyway, this particular uh, gladiator, Seximus. 200 in a day. Killed two. Oh, defeated 200 wild starving is animals in eight an hour right is that incredible Something now like let that. me put this into perspective okay there was a lion that was released that killed a hundred um a hundred gladiators in a day well he clearly didn't fight that lion because that uh, lion would have destroyed him well. at the start of the next day <laughs> while it was still tired it, well, he was called Biggest Bollocksus, yeah. that lion. So it's. Um, so, so what, it's, what's the point here? I'm, I'm completely lost. Why are you lost? The, the point is that there were some famous gladiators. Right. So. I'm right. lost. Are you lost? Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> we were on Romans, and then I was just saying, I had <laughs> I saw something interesting about. Well, so, what we need sorry, sorry, is I lost the plot 201 was volunteers. Also a very famous gladiator. So, mm. uh, he, was, he was a real one as well. They were all real, but that name Spartacles yeah. is real. I'm not. I'm not sure about Flanimus and Biggest Bollocksus and stuff like that. There, <laughs> that, that might not be accurate. It might just be scrawled in a Roman <laughs> bathroom but, somewhere. But yeah. they are real people. I'm just not sure about the names. Okay, that's the only bit that wasn't true and well, yeah. may not have been true and all of that. Well, there's one thing for you. Romans, whenever they were out and about, loved their graffiti. 
Yes. You go to any ancient site where Rome sort of conquered or had mm -hmm. a a garrison there, you will find that the locals will have graffitied their names on pretty much anything and everything they could lay a knife to. This is entirely off topic. It's yeah. probably going to get cut from the show. But did they graffiti lots of willies on the wall? So, did I, I hear remember. that right? I don't remember. Ben, uh, is, I, ben is nodding. Ben, tell me. Ben knows about this. I'm glad one of us knows about this. They, they did do that, Ben, didn't they? Yeah, so they would have done it as sort of like rude graffiti. And then sometimes, actually, a lot of Roman soldiers would draw phalluses on their shields as well, as sort of like a sort of mocking to the enemy as well. So there you go. How do you draw a phalluses? Well, a phalluses is some kind of dodgy argument, isn't it? No, phalluses. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, okay. <laughs> Although, that would distract your enemy if you're, like, thrusting your shield. Just PSS, wait, man. Like... I've got a dodgy... I've got a straw man on the front of my shield. <laughs> yeah. I do remember there was a, a stone find that uh, a Roman slinger would have used. A Roman swinger? Slinger. Oh, slinger. Sorry, yes. And what they had carved on it was essentially what said, take that. As and they lumped that again, going, take that. Had it written I take that been around that long. <laughs> yeah, they, they must have been in the Colosseum. <laughs> <laughs> this was in between Four the nights. animal slaughter. <laughs> they embrace him like he's one of their own. Next up, take that. And then sucks him up. Fucking wild. Ben, it's that time. What's going on in the world? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we're going to kick off the news with some stuff out of Parabellum War Games. Yep. Uh, now, we've been teasing a few sort of bits and pieces for these guys over the last couple of weeks or so, but they've yeah. actually come around to showing off some of the renders for some of the models that are going to be part of Conquest, which is oh. their game that they're bringing out around, or they're showing off at least, mm -hmm. at Essenspiel this year. So, uh, the first thing we're going to be showing off is actually some of the renders for the Spire Archers. Now, um, both oh. these and the Brutes we're going to see in a second are from like a, a clone-style faction in the game. Yeah. They're called the Spire, and they effectively bred a lot of these creatures and sort of chemically changed them and magically changed them for a lot of, like, sport and stuff. Mm -hmm. But now things are hitting up in terms of the battles and things at the same time. They're taking them out onto the field. And so, for example, you've got these clones here that are these archers done in a very sort of Asian style that are, like, the perfect shots, the most agile and graceful of their, of their, of their kind. Do you know what I think is so interesting mm -hmm. about this mini? And I don't know if this is a weird observation for me, but the three arms... Yes. In the lower, because yes. usually you see a lot of forearms, you see a lot of doubling of things, but it's very mm. rare you see two. And I'm, that that lower around the perfect archer, that is how you I'm would. I'm struggling to think of an asymmetric um, creature model? or model. Mm. I'm I'm really struggling. Unless to it's a big gangly demon thing, but even then they're yeah. quite yeah. yeah. It, well, even it, even in actual nature, things are generally symmetrical. Yeah. They will mirror the sides. So it's one of the yeah, first so, things that struck yeah. me about this. And that it, the big long thing at the back there, Ben, is that the quiver? Is that what Careful now. Yes, uh, oh yes, I yeah. see what you're talking about now, yes. Yeah, it's so that's yeah. the quiver. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the one arm would then load the, uh, the uh, arrows into the bow while the other one pulls the arrow back and shoots it. So yeah, it's pretty cool. It, they, it's it's almost cool. like they've done this thing, as I said, like they've got the perfect archer mm -hmm. uh, brought to life in these. So yeah. I really like that. But you know what I also like? I love the artwork that these guys are coming mm -hmm. out with. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the artwork is just uh, yeah. incredible. Yeah look, 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 yeah, look at the finesse in that. It's mm. very. Yeah, that that whole the whole imagery of the perfect archer, I think they've captured it really well. Yeah, yeah. but it, it does have the the feel of a, a Japanese style archer with that really yes. long bow. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, and then the other one that they showed off is actually the brute drones from the spire mm -hmm. as well. And these are clones that have been done in a slightly different way. While you've got the agile oh. and graceful nature of the archers, these spire brutes are effectively bred simply to become living. Uh, battering rams on the battlefield uh, so they're pumped full of chemicals and all sorts of different things and then encased and sort of locked inside this armor that causes oh, that's them exactly ongoing, what I was ask. an incredible yeah. pain and they basically just go mental on the battlefield destroying things ripping things apart smashing into things destroying troops or whatever and they actually uh, they've actually been sort of dropping a few hints as to sort of like the background thing mm -hmm. and stuff at the same time so one of the things about these guys is they're actually controlled by what are called ferromancers uh, who are kind of like the sort of controllers of these guys yeah. and they're the only ones that can guide their berserk fury as they go around destroying uh, people on the battlefield is it to do with so, pheromones are they guided is, it is that, is that why they're called so, yeah, ferromancers yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, that's interesting. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what that has uh, 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 smackings of? Insect Synapse mm. on, the, on the Tyranids. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. one of the things I've always loved and always detested about the Tyranid <laughs> army um, is, uh, is the whole concept of Synapse. Yeah. And I've always uh, uh, wondered about Synapse having a bit of a, th a pheromone kind mm. of a thing. But I, I, that, yeah. that is really interesting. So these are big 
horrible dudes mm. that are encased in the most pa uh, the most painful armor ever, yeah. Yeah. and then that does not look unleashed. What I absolutely love is like the, the detail, for example, of putting the circle, the holes in the blades to maybe lighten them and make them more vicious. And also, I can envision this thing putting them both together and like charging with the two forward. But I can also envision him spinning around like a berserker, like a whirlwind. Slicing stuff in it, half. Yeah. It looks like a bread to kill machine, which I'm so on board with. Yeah. yeah. Although the weapons do look battle worn, the guitars. Mm. Nice. That's amazing. That is amazing. If, and if that was set in the future and they had chains, chainsaws on them, they could be called electric guitars. Oh! <laughs> I'm sorry. That was crap, that, that, wasn't it? I'm not, I'm not giving you it. I'm not, I'm not. That hurts. I'm not giving you it. That okay, hurts. right. I'm excited. There was a moment during the boot camp yes. where this sudden wave of girly screams just was it when you came in just, in that pink sequence it was dress? it was like it was like the, the sound was a bit like <laughs> like that there okay yeah, and that. It, was, it was a little wave that, went, that, that went through just a corner of the boot camp where lloyd was standing and jerry, jerry was, was standing, standing yeah. and and one or two others and that <laughs> could only mean one thing saga two man <laughs> then what do we know about it Okay, so yeah, Studio Tomahawk uh, showed off a little bit of a teaser of what's coming in 2018. So it's still a little way to go, but they're going to be working on Saga 2nd Edition. Uh, it's going to be a new rulebook that will contain rules and sort of factions from the ancient times, medieval, dark ages. And they're also throwing in a lot of fantasy as well to, into the mix, which I thought was pretty awesome. So yeah, they're going to be dealing with all of these. They're going to be battle boards and all sorts of different things for that, we assume, going forward. But as well as that, they're also going to be working on what's, what they're going to be calling the Book of Battles as well. And this will be a supplementary tome that will go alongside it. And it will provide you with scenarios and extra special rules as well. Maybe this is where we're going to see a lot more of the focus towards specific eras of fighting uh, so we'll have some more sort of in-depth rules for medieval combat and dark age fighting but the thing that really excites me is the idea of doing some awesome stuff with fantasy because i love the idea of doing what everyone has talked about for a long time like beowulf and things like that mm. and so yeah it'd be really cool to see how this comes together the, the next couple of months is so. really nice in that picture i see i'm, I'm a huge uh, fan of it i'd like this? to see yeah i very much like to see that do we know who that. does the, the werewolf mini then as far as I can tell from the comments, that werewolf is actually one of the ones from Mantic Games. So I think it's actually Ooh, one of those. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, a Beowulf scenario would mm. be would be yeah, fabulous. Yeah. So because uh, uh, I think we have, in fact, I'm almost sure we have. We haven't built it yet. It's going to be part of the Kattegat um, mm -hmm. yeah, table. We have a Viking we, hall. We have a huge kind of Viking hall, which mm. would be like the hall that that um, the Grendel, yeah. the uh, yeah. the Grendel attacked. Um, so imagine. Oh. We could we could get a great big ass Grendel figure, yeah. Okay, and then have our Viking warband in there, and have Beowulf himself, and recreate that slaughter <laughs> that took place inside the 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 drinking hall. That sounds epic. Could be cool. I think that'll be awesome. I think that'll be awesome. Right. Um. In other big news, for any of you guys that love Firefly, <laughs> just happy hear... birthday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <you> do. <laughs> um, uh, there's a, a a very special and limited edition pre-order. Time going sensitive. On. Yeah, this is time sensitive. Only runs to September 28th. Okay, and it's for the brigands and brown coats. Ben, fill us in. Yeah, so uh, this is the game that was shown off at Gen Con uh, from the guys at Gear Force 9. This is the Firefly Adventures game where you'll be playing as the crew from uh, uh, from that amazing TV show. And you'll be going out and doing, que well, not quests, but missions and stuff on the tabletop. Some really cool looking miniatures. But the big thing for this is the pre-order period that we talked about there. So yes, this one goes until September 28th. And if you pre-order using their special uh, sign-up thing on their web store, which you can go and follow in the show notes below, mm -hmm. you can go over there and get yourself some awesome looking resin terrain. And also the Naked Mal model as well, which They're is the very one that was only mouth, available yeah. at Gen Con yeah. before this, which is pretty cool. Oh, so. right. So all of these extras um, uh, are included for anybody that signs up during the pre-order period. Mm. Yes. And also, yeah. um, uh, I pick, uh, uh, you should also join the Facebook page of the Facebook group as well if you get a chance. So um, yes. let's yeah, get a so link in there. Yeah, so they wanted to stress this was done in celebration almost of the Facebook group and the community they built it behind it, but you don't have to sign up to the Facebook group in order to qualify for the pre-order. Yeah, that's something they have to definitely uh, stress. So okay, yeah. So 
So yeah, if you like the game and you like the look of this, and you want to get it on the pre-order, you can easily just go and get it from the Gale Force 9 web store. Okay. Yeah, but if you are going to jump in on that pre-order, why would you not want to jump into the Facebook group? Because some exactly. people don't like Facebook. Really? Well, okay. Yeah, there, there are still some people out there. Fair enough. I, and, and, and every day I'm this close to joining them. So it's like... <laughs> <laughs> Shut down there, Kate. So, um, yeah. It's um, uh, if you're if you're into it in a big way, go ahead and join that Facebook group because you'll get all the latest updates and stuff like that. Yeah. Otherwise, um, head across and grab yourself a, a naked mall, and we will <laughs> we will keep him and his clippers away, so you will be safe. No, 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 they, they've done him in a very decent pose. Okay, we have <laughs> a um, really, really interesting mm. article series. This one's been yeah. worked on now for a long time. So um, it, it's about the Saratoga. So this is um, to do with the American Revolution. Yeah. It also covers the, the Battle of Oriskany, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. uh, which yep. is great, and um, it's written by uh, Oriskany. So we, to try and fill us in to give us some background to this. Uh, before we go off and uh, read the article, we uh, managed to catch up with Oriskany and uh, get his take on it. Fight for the Iron Kingdoms as a warcaster. Take control of the mighty jacks, arcane devices, and dark sorceries to bring the fight to the War Machine Hub on beastsofwar.com. A world of hideous nightmares awaits in Kingdom Death Monster. Fight to survive or fade into darkness at the Kingdom Death Hub at BeastsOfWar.com Hello everybody, Az here, joined today by Justin and Jim. We are here today to chat a little bit about the 240th anniversary of what we call the Saratoga Battles or the Saratoga Campaign. Mm. Uh, Jim is actually in the middle of bringing out five more articles to basically kind of cover everything you can really expect to see and how that's going to work on the tabletop. So we've invited Jim on again to have a bit of chat to him about some of the history, mm. about how the whole thing played out, and what we might do if we want to kind of replicate that on the table. All right, uh, I'll tell you what, can I give Jim the first question? Absolutely, from here? can. All right, so Jim, the, the first thing we need to know in these article series is, can you give us a brief overview of exactly what Saratoga was, uh, what the project's going to be doing, and what we're going to be expecting to see in the article series? Okay, well, um, like as was saying, um, September and October marked the 240th anniversary of the Battles of Saratoga. So, you know, with all the Team Yankee and Dunkirk and Midway and Six Day War content that we've been coming out with lately uh, for the last few months, we wanted to take a little bit of a step back from that and try out a different uh, period of history. Black Powder is always a big favorite uh, with Napoleonics, American Civil War, English Civil War. So with these anniversaries coming up, I thought it would be a great idea to try some American Revolution or American War of Independence, as some prefer, um, to try to come up with some content in that period uh, instead. Okay, so the, the period of history we're looking at is really that, that transition from the old school warfare into now full-on armed guns at the ready warfare. Yes, Jim? It's definitely a big part of it, yeah. Um, before uh, the American Revolution, uh, the American Revolution is kind of like in the middle of that middle of that uh, change that you were mentioning. So it goes like from the Seven Years' War in the 1750s, 1760s, um, into the American Revolution, which was really a very small affair in, in the, on the world stage. Uh, and then you get into the Napoleonics, which was obviously a much larger conflict. So between the 1750s and the 18-teens, uh, you, between Frederick the Great and Waterloo, you really do see a bit of a, a transformation um, in the way uh, black powder warfare really works. Mm -hmm. And I must admit, I don't know a huge amount about the American Revolution. In fact, I don't know if it's something we really talk about a lot here in, in Great Britain. I don't think it's something we mention a huge well, amount. Well, you know, it's, it's one of those times in history when the British Empire was pretty much starting to crumble and starting to fall down a little bit. <laughs> we don't acknowledge it maybe as much as we should. And, and what kind of role did this campaign then play in that greater story, Jim? Um, well, honestly, Saratoga and the campaign in which it takes place, the whole Saratoga campaign, it, this really is the turning point of the American Revolution. This is the Revolution Stalingrad, or El Alamein. Um, it's Great Britain's first big defeat in the American Revolution. There had been some setbacks before, a little battles like Trenton and Princeton in 1776, early 1777. But this was going to be, uh, yeah, really the big one. So here in the U.S., it's really kind of a big deal. You know, we need aircraft carriers after this battle. Uh, it's really a watershed in our early history. And uh, to be quite frank, um, and in all honesty to all, you know, all my friends in the U.K., um, as an American, uh, when you win this few battles, I mean, we lost like 90% of the battles in the American Revolution. Wow. When you, when you once in a while do manage to win one, you 
tend to make, you know, a big. It, it makes yeah. sense that you would make a big deal out of it yeah, if you were losing ninety yeah. percent. Hooray! We won one. <laughs> uh, we finally won one. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. So the the Saratoga campaign. Uh, I'm wondering what it's about. You know, uh, in broad strokes, what exactly happens during Saratoga? Okay. Well, um, like most wars, uh, the American Revolution has theaters. Uh, there's a northern, southern, a northern, southern, and central theater. So far, I've been mostly in the center. Uh, where Saratoga takes place is definitely in the Northern Theater. So there's no Washington up here, there's no Howe, nor Cornwallis, uh, Henry Clinton, uh, none of the big famous generals that people usually tend to associate with the American Revolution. And there's none of the, you know, classic uh, continental blue versus British redcoat, uh, right, okay. you know, the, the red British regulars, kind of linear battles up here. Um, it's really a different kind of warfare. So as soon as the American Revolution starts in 1775, uh, there's action as far north as Quebec, Canada. Wow. Uh, somebody got the bright idea in their head to invade Canada and try and take that country over <laughs> Whoa. before we even finished setting up our own country. I didn't know that at all, actually. America invaded Canada. Uh, yes. America declared her own independence on July 4th, famously. Uh, yeah. July 4th, 1776. But on November 30th, 1775, we'd already invaded another country <laughs> to try and take over somebody else. We oh, had 13 colonies. We, we wanted an even number. We wanted 14. You know, 13 is <laughs> kind of an unlucky number. So we, we went for a 14th. And uh, man, we kind of went over this a, a few years ago in the American Revolution article mm. series. It came that close. I mean, there almost is one North American country right now. Oh, From my Key word. West to uh, Barrow, Alaska is almost one big red, white, and blue. That wow. is not something I was aware of at all, yeah, actually. Almost, that is absolutely crazy. Happened. I have to wonder who, who sat down and thought, this is a fantastic idea. Let's invade north where it's colder. <laughs> that would be the Massachusetts Committee of Safety. Um, you got to remember, in, in the American Revolution, we tend to think today of, you know, there's Canada, there's the United States, there's Mexico, there's, country, you know, there's countries in the Caribbean, and, you know, all these, you know, areas of land that are sharply divided by these well-defined borders. In, you know, this, in, in this century... It's just British America. It's like this big mass of colonies. And where exactly um, America was going to be, uh, the United States, even for people in the United States, people who were trying to set up the country at the time, where I was going to include probably parts of the Caribbean, Florida, which was owned by Spain, then by Britain, then by Spain again. <laughs> um, uh, of, of course, uh, there was big parts of uh, Canada that had been owned by the French, then the British one in the Seven Years' War, and now the Americans almost took it away from the British again, and it's it's very fluid. It's very, you know, there aren't really any clear borders out here. Even some of the states, the, the original 13 colonies, mm -hmm. the borders aren't clearly defined. So uh, it sounds crazy today, and uh, it was a bit of a long shot, but it all, we almost pulled it off. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> and all when right. it comes to these specific periods, this, this happened, these two battles over the period of, of, of the two months you mentioned, September, October, what was sort of the, the key pinnacle points of the battles then? What, what were the key points over the two months? And with the warfare, you mentioned no borders, so I assume things like rivers, roads, the terrain is going to have a big effect on that. Yeah, especially rivers and lakes. Um, so after we failed to take over Canada in 1775 and 76, there's a counter-invasion back down uh, into uh, what is now upstate New York. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a very thin lake that extends from partly in Canada all the way down like halfway through New York State called Lake Champlain. Uh, we talked about that a little bit back in the uh, American Revolution series. Uh, it's definitely a big part of this campaign as well. This is a very, very long and a very, very thin lake, and it comes just short of the headwaters of the Hudson River. And, of course, the Hudson River goes all the way down to New York Harbor, which the British now occupy after a very successful campaign mm -hmm. uh, for the British in 1776. So the reason I mention all this is because there are really no roads up there, and there are definitely no bridges across the Hudson. Okay. Um, so if you're the British and you have a navy, and, of course, the Americans really don't, if you're able to come down from Canada via Lake Champlain make that little hop over to the top of the Hudson River, the headwaters of the Hudson, and then sail down the Hudson, you now own a nearly unbroken string of water from basically southern Canada all the way down to New York Harbor. Wow. And that cuts off um, a lot of the colonies to the east. That cuts off, especially the really, really troublesome ones. That cuts off Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts especially, um, New Hampshire. These are the really hardcore, die-hard 
rebel colonies. This is pretty much where the rebellion started. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A lot of the other states, um, Pennsylvania was another big one, but a lot of the other states, uh, New Jersey, definitely South Carolina, uh, North Carolina, they were they were rebelling along with all the others. They had the other 13 colonies, but they weren't nearly as into it. Um, and if you could cut off like this hotbed of rebellion from everybody else, um, kind of beat it up and grind it down while leaving the rest of them to kind of watch what was happening, they're going to be like, ah, you know what, we're not really that into it anymore. So that was part of the British strategy. Cut off this hotbed of the rebellion via these waterways and then, uh, you know, split the American colonies in half, reduce the part that's really causing all the trouble, and then the rest will probably, you know, throw in the towel. Mm-hmm. And now, if I understand this right, at this time in American history, the colonies hadn't expanded into the rest of America yet. It was all down on that, oh, that no. eastern coast, yeah? Oh, absolutely. I, like, they call the 13 colonies, you know, for a reason. There's only 13, uh, mm. there's only 13 states. Some of the states at these battles, uh, specifically in, in the, uh, the Saratoga campaign, some of the states in which the battles take place aren't even states yet. They're wow. really parts of other states. They haven't really, like we were talking earlier about borders. Mm. Uh, one of our first battles, the Battle of Hubbardton, takes place in what is now Vermont. There really wasn't a Vermont back then. It was what They were still calling it the Hampshire Grants. It was still part of New Hampshire. Mm. So, so obviously, I mean, no one to give away spoilers as such. But what kind but of no, battle? I, I don't want to know what happened in the American Revolution. <laughs> I don't know that. But whenever it comes to your article series, Jim, like what battles are you going to be focusing on? Like what can the readers kind of expect to see as we kind of explore this? Okay, well, uh, it's five-part article series, and we're focusing on one specific engagement per uh, part of the article okay. series. So our first one is the Battle of Hubbardton. Um, that's a great little delaying action. It's one of my. Uh, it's it's definitely an interesting battle. Um, with all the talk we've been talking about, or with all the material that we've been going over with Dunkirk and uh, delaying actions, uh, I didn't plan this, I promise. It just <laughs> happens to be that the first big battle um, in the Northern Theater in the summer of 77 is a, uh, 1777, is a, excuse me, is a delaying action. So we do that one in part one. Um, the Battle of Oriskany, believe it or yeah. not. There is, yeah, hey, there you go. Well, the hey, Battle hey, of Oriskany. Hey. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure everyone, if you don't know at this point, Jim's name on BeastsOfWar.com is Oriskany. Yeah, I'm wondering, did he take the name from the battle, or has he crowbarred his name in for the battle in this? Is this an actual historical battle? Battle of Oriskany definitely happened. Okay. The Battle of Oriskany happens August 6th, 1777. It's part of the fighting for Fort Stanwix, uh, a little bit further west uh, in, in New York State. Uh, it's definitely a bloodbath. Um any, any chance we big. could get you to reenact it, Jim? Get you and the family together in the house, do a battle, do a battle of Oriskany enacted by uh, Oriskany? <laughs> we did it in 20 millimeter. That's about as close as I want to get to this one. Um, <laughs> it's it's funny because one of the uh, the British commander, or actually he's an American, uh, the American commander for the crown. Got to remember, a lot of Americans fought for both sides um, in this war. Um, the American, co- the the British, the crown commander uh, for this battle. His name was Sir John Johnson. Oh, wow. uh, no relation. It's just a common name. Um, but yeah, there's definitely the Battle of Oriskany. We do that in part two. Um, per capita, as far as the percentage of the men engaged and how many casualties they took, it's still probably, if not the one of the top, uh, bloodiest battles in American history. Wow. Um, a, a small battle, but almost everybody who went into it got at least wounded. Oh my goodness. Okay. It, was, it was really a, it was, it was a nasty one. Wow. Uh, part three, we, we do the Battle of Bennington, which features... What history likes to call as the Hessians, which is kind of a misnomer, uh, these are German regiments that were rented or leased or contracted, right. I'm not sure what the kind of word you want to use, uh, from uh, various provinces in uh, what is today Germany, uh, Hesse, um, Brunswick, Prussia, Bavaria. They would do is, this is after the Seven Years' War, um, when uh, these German uh, provinces uh, had a great army. That's really about all they had. They were also in a lot of financial trouble. They had just come through the Seven Years' War. So, princes and, and lords would do in Germany was, or in what is now Germany, would rent out their regiments to other kings. Um, so the Hessians, again, that's not really the right term for it. That's just what history calls them, because uh, they didn't all come from Hesse. Uh, these Hessians uh, have like a, a, a reputation as being mercenaries. Mm-hmm. And they really, they really weren't. They're not mercenaries the way we think of them today. Anyway, um, John Burgoyne's army, that's the British overall commander, um, he is uh, he's using a great deal of uh, these Hessian soldiers, 
and that's where they get mixed up uh, in one of the big battles, the Battle of Bennington. And then parts four and five, just to wrap up quickly, are the uh, first and second battles of Freeman's Farm. These are the two actual battles that history has kind of condensed into the Battle of Oriskany. So first Freeman's Farm takes place September uh, 19th, 1777. Second Freeman's Farm, October 7th, uh, 1777. And again, these are the battles that uh, history is kind of remembered as the uh, the Battle of Saratoga. And these are the battles that really turned it around for the, for the United States, or what was going to become the United States, in a really, really big way. Okay, so it's really just about three weeks separating those two big battles then that turned it on around. And they both happened at the same place? The exact same yeah. farm, same guy's yeah. farm, yeah. My word. And so what systems are you going to be talking about then when it comes to kind of bringing, you know, the whole Saratoga campaign to the tabletop? What have you been testing? What are, what kind of, what are you going to dip into? Well, ever since I got back from Canada in June, I went up to Canada in June. Uh, readers may remember uh, the Fantasy Wargaming yep. article mm-hmm. series that I did with, uh, with Craig Pauls. Ever since I got, he used a uh, uh, battle system, TSR's battle system, first edition, uh, for a D type campaign. And ever since I got back from Canada, I've had this itch for Battle System. <laughs> uh, battle System is uh, it's a different edition of Battle System. It's second edition. Again, it's originally written for Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, second edition of all things. I know, <laughs> I know that sounds crazy, but, but just go with me on this. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a little confused, Jim. It, a role-playing yeah. game system being used for a war game, yeah? Well, Battle System was a, uh, both first and second edition of Battle System, was set up to be like a mass combat uh, addendum or a last combat module to use in addition to DMD. Oh, okay, that makes sense. So, if your characters, if your characters get up to such a level that you know the, the the DM is throwing like legions of red dragons at you at this point, it's like, all right, you know what, you've broken the game. Um, how about we set up, we set you up with a castle and an army and a little fiefdom, and now you can battle with each other. Uh, you know the way successful noblemen really did back then, mm-hmm. which was on the battlefield in a war game. So Battle System 2nd Edition is kind of the granddaddy of Kings of War. <laughs> it's uh, slightly more um, intense or realistic, if that's the word you want to use, a, a few more rules. But if you've played Kings of War, you would recognize most of Battle System anyway. Okay. So I, we, we've seen uh, plenty of uh, demo games with Justin uh, in the Conquering Kings of War series, which I always do watch, by the way. <laughs> cool. um, there's, there, there, there's a lot of firearms in that game. 2nd Edition Battle System does include Archibusiers, which is basically like a matchlock, uh, English Civil War, late Renaissance kind of a firearm. Um, with that, it, it's that's baked into the game, you know, out of the box. Uh, so for the American Revolution, we're talking about flintlocks instead of matchlocks. It's basically a different kind of musket that fires a little faster mm-hmm. than a matchlock. It's a little bit more safe. Um, so with just a very little bit of tweaking, believe it or not, uh, a game originally written for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. It does work for the American Revolution just fine. We've had a lot of games so far. Uh, that's me and my friend Alex uh, at Ross on the website. Oh, okay. So far, he's been playing uh, the British uh, mostly. Um, mm-hmm. He's really anxious to try out his Prussians. Uh, I'm sure, I should say his Hessians, his his Brunswickers, his uh, his Hessians. He's really anxious to try them out when we do the Battle of Bennington. Uh, mm-hmm. I almost don't want to tell him that the, the Germans lose that battle very, very badly. <laughs> oh, you're such maybe a nice guy, Joe. Maybe, <laughs> maybe he'll turn it around. Maybe he'll, uh, he'll he'll change some history, so we'll see how that so goes. We, we know scenarios can be fun when you're playing from the loser's side. There's nothing yeah. like upturning history and turning it your way with yeah. a bit of different strategy. Well, then, like, they're, Let me they're tell you, if, if you're the Americans and you're playing in the American Revolution, you better enjoy losing battles. <laughs> <laughs> see, here's, here's the thing. There used to be a, an old TV show on uh, BBC... Uh, called Time Commanders. Yes. Where they would actually take and refight mm-hmm. historical battles using like the, the Total War the Engine. Total War Engine, yeah. It was really, really cool. Doing it this way, you kind of get that same feeling. Mm-hmm. But, Jim, I have a question for you. So, uh, what are some of the highlights that people can expect, you know, whenever they're sitting down to read the article? You know, what are some of those those key moments, those those key cool things that are going to be coming out during yeah, what, the Yeah, what, what did make Saratoga you know, so important? What's, what's yeah. really going to be relished? Yeah. Okay, well, um, like I was saying earlier, this is not the traditional image of the American Revolution. Uh, blue on one side, red on the other, lining up, you know, the British playing the British Grenadier with regimental colors flying. Mm. Um, there's a little bit of that, but not much. This is a lot more complex, and it's a lot more than just two factions. Um, there's the American Continental Army, um, the British regulars, so, you know, the usual. But on top of that, we have a lot of these crown Germans that we've been discussing. 
uh, regiments from Hesse Hanau, Brunswick, Prussia, that were rented by the King of England um, and for the by the Minister of American uh, Affairs, American Colonies, uh, during the duration or for the duration of the war. Mm. Um, there are lots of American militia running around. These are not really soldiers. These are guys that they're militia. You know, they're mm-hmm. guys that get called up out of their farms, out of their towns, um, mostly Dutch and a lot of German descent. Um, they still speak, uh, you know, Dutch, or they still speak German, even though they're Americans and they're fighting uh, on the American side. And of course, a lot of these German uh, um, immigrants or descendants of German immigrants are fighting against German regiments, like again, like I was saying before, uh, rented from Hesha. So there's all, there's all kinds of craziness going on. Canadian Rangers, a huge number of American loyalists. This is especially true in the Battle of Oriskany. Battle of Oriskany was fought largely, not entirely, between um, American Patriot Militia and American Loyalist Militia. It's one of the bloodiest battles in the American Revolution. There isn't a British officer within 10 miles of this thing. Oh, my goodness. Uh, they're all Americans. Yeah, that's part of what makes it so bloody. Civil wars are always the worst. Um, there are six nations of the Iroquois Confederacy in this. Four of them fought for the Crown, and uh, two of them fought for the Patriots, and they do fight each other. Uh, they fought each other a little bit at Oriskany and around Oriskany to the mm-hmm. point where Oriskany now sometimes translates in Iroquois as the beginning of sorrowful things. It was really the first fatal crack in their, uh, the great peace that they had set up uh, to kind of glue these six nations together. Mm-hmm. There's some really colorful characters in here. I mean, the kind of characters that a novelist can never make up. You've got the British commander, <laughs> Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne. He's launching this invasion on a bet. He bet somebody in London, he was a member of parliament, I don't know if he was a member of parliament at this exact time, he bet somebody in London 20,000 pounds sterling that I'm going to have this war wrapped up in the next year. Really? So That's not terrifying, yeah, isn't so it? So not, not only is he, uh, is he you know, putting his army and his reputation at the stake, he's got a lot of money riding on this. We've got Benedict Arnold. Everyone knows Benedict yeah. Arnold as the greatest traitor in American history. This is back when he was a badass hero. <laughs> Benedict Arnold is America's Anakin Skywalker. That's probably the best way I can put it. Really? He, okay. He was our greatest hero until he fell to the dark side. Uh, wow. <laughs> to put it in a weird way. Where's the dark side? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, until he turned on, he, until he turned on his people. Yeah. Uh, we got the the other American commander. They called him Granny Gates. Uh, Horatio Gates, he was a major in the British Army before the war. He fought for the British in the Seven Years' War. Now he's fighting for the Americans, but he's way too cautious to the point where his men used to call him Grandma. They called him Granny Gates. Um, I can describe the way this whole war takes place up in the north, the Saratoga campaign, especially for people in the UK. is uh, It's a lot less like the Patriot that you might see from Mel Gibson <laughs> and a lot more like Sharps Rifles. Okay. Um, I mean, almost everybody has seen at least one of those episodes with Sean Bean and Sharps Rifles. Yeah. Sharps Rifles, the battles are very small. Skirmish games work great. Battle system works on one figure equals uh, 10 men. We're able to put the entire Battle of Hubbardton on one 6x4 table. Wow. The entire Battle of Oriskany on one 6x4 table with room to spare. Mm. And once we get into the battles of Saratoga, we're no longer able to do that. We have to pick a certain place. Mm-hmm. But um, unlike, the, uh, say, like Waterloo, these really large battles that you can't do all on one tabletop. Um, some of these battles are so small, you can put them on a tabletop in a miniature game and do it right. right. Um, you're kind of out in the middle of nowhere, kind of like Sharp's Rifles. Sharp's, most of Sharp's Rifles takes place in Spain and Portugal, which at the time was very politically unstable. You've got um, small groups. Most of the people who are fighting in this war aren't really soldiers. They're civilians of one type or another. Uh, militias and guerrilla bands, the savage fighting. This was not the gentleman's, you know, American Revolution. There are stories of prisoners being killed and eaten. Oh, my God. Wow. Yeah. Kidding. Um, they're dismissed by most historians. Most historians. Um, there are people who are being scalped. Johnny Burgoyne is keeping uh, the Mohawk part of his nation together by 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 buying scalps that they're taking off of white settlers. Uh, and then, of course, once American Patriot Militia gets a hold of some of the American Loyalist Militia, they're, they're doing things to their prisoners that are even worse. Oh my There's incredible savagery on both sides. It, it gets medieval up here. It really mm-hmm. does. Um, it's not the continental-style battlefields that we see in New Jersey and Pennsylvania and you know the, the other parts of the war. And a lot of shifting alliances. You've got people switching sides. You've got a lot of spy craft, deception, double dealing. Um, again, a lot like uh, your usual episode of Sharps Rifles. Um, mm. So games like uh, like Sharps would, would really, you know, 
do well up here as well if you want to use that yeah. instead of battle system. Well, uh, I'm, I'm just having a think here. Recently, I actually got introduced to Sharp Practice, mm. yep. which is a, a really nice sort of zoomed in sort of feel yeah. for a, that sort of time period and that sort of black powder mm -hmm. warfare. I think I might grab it if I was going to play a game of this. The rules system sounds like it would be very appropriate, though I did not realise just how... Med I used the word medieval there, Jim. Yeah. This yeah. was not. This did not sound like rank-and-file organised much. This sounded like definitely a bit more chaotic and a bit yeah. more gritty. It's this is the thing. Well, the, I mean, the, like... the, the, the terrain up there is so dense. Mm. This is uh, woods with no roads. And when I say woods, I mean like it took Johnny Burgoyne something like 30 miles to advance 30 days. They have to cut down every wow. tree in their way. They're building the road as they go. Um, it's, it's crazy up here. So even if this was, you know, in a place where the generals had a little more control over their own men, the generals didn't control their own, their own armies half mm -hmm. the time up here. Mm -hmm. Even if you were in that kind of a place, uh, the terrain wouldn't allow, you know, open uh, battles mm -hmm. like the kind you normally see in an American, like an American Revolutionary War movie. Yeah. Now, that said, once you get to the actual two battles of Saratoga, first and second Freeman's farm, things do open up a little bit. They do manage to find some poor guy's, you know, farm. I've been to this battlefield a few times myself. Oh, wow. Uh, the, the fields are actually very, very small. Mm. You but see, you can fit an army of about 12,000 men on there. See, and, I, I uh, just have to think, that poor guy, you know, there's been a battle at his farm, Okay, everybody has pissed off. I can start repairing. Not again! I just missed the house. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was it was it was pretty rough. Mm. Uh, McBride's farm, Freeman's farm. There's the Coulter's farm. There's like four or five farms, but Freeman's farm was in the middle of it mm. uh, twice. And from yeah, from, um, from what you're saying there, Jim, it sounds like they had to utilize those small areas of open space to try and actually have full-on clashes that weren't guerrilla warfare. It sounded yeah. like it was just natural they would come to these small bits of open ground. Yeah, it's, it's it's kind of near the river, so again, the river is that invasion route because there's no road. So uh, any kind of open ground near the river is the place where you're going to try and set up your army. Mm. Uh, so almost no cavalry up here uh, that I know of. Um, the British really only had two regiments of cavalry in the entire American Revolution, and neither of them were up here. Mm. And the Americans couldn't afford it because uh, you know we were broke at the time. <laughs> and the uh, yeah, so there's not really that much cavalry up here. Artillery, there's a little bit of artillery. Um, again, it's very tough to maneuver artillery through this kind of terrain. Mm. And uh, the, again, the Americans couldn't afford it. Uh, what little artillery the Americans did have, they lost at one of their forts, Fort Ticonderoga. And then um, once it gets through the actual battles of Freeman's Farm, the British try to set up their artillery. They find out that American riflemen can shoot further than the British cannons. Oh, wow. So... Yeah, what happens is the uh, British artillery crews try to set up their, their six-pounders and their 12-pounders, and they're just getting, you know, mowed down by these American riflemen that are hiding in the tree line mm. four, you know, three, four, sometimes even more, 100 yards away, th you know, three or 400 yards away. Mm. So artillery becomes almost useless. You know, to try and stand there next to a gun with that big sponge and operate a cannon is suicide because obviously you're going to get wow. shot at first. Do you yeah. happen to know, Jim, like the, the rifles that the Americans were using to kind of reach that kind of range? Were they made in America? Were they buying them in? Was it was that coming from France? Like, where, like how did that... Do you know, do you have any well, history were, on that? Yeah, they were definitely made in America. Wow. They were uh, civilian hunting weapons. Wow. Um, and they do have some... They have, uh, again, a musket is a smooth war weapon, uh, as we see in Sharps rifles. And if you ever played paintball you have basically firing a round ball out of a smoothbore weapon, and a paintball is just small enough or slow enough where you can see it travel, and it goes like a corkscrew. You fire mm -hmm. a paint, you have no idea where that thing's going. Mm -hmm. This is what a musket does. This is why they lined up in those blocks that look so ridiculous to us today. That's the only way to get any kind of decent firepower um, is to get like a 1,000 guys together in a tight block, have them all fire at once, and out of those 1,000 guys, maybe 10 of them will hit somebody. My goodness. Um, I'm actually not making that up. Uh, the, the, the hit rates are like 1 to 100, 1 to 300 mm. at, at some of the battles. The American rifle had a spiral groove, like all, all firearms do today, that puts an aerodynamic spin on the barrel. I'm sorry, on the bullet as it leaves the barrel. Um, the loading rates on this weapon are a lot, lot longer. As bad as it is to fire a musket, you maybe you can get off three shots a minute if you have a lot of practice. The American rifle, it's sometimes like one shot per minute. My word. Because you're used because you're used to shooting at deer that don't fight back. Yeah. You know, you can take your time. Also, the American rifle can't take the bayonet. Um, one of the very, very few historically accurate parts of the television series turn is uh, they have a scene where they're training guys to fire with the brown best musket, and the drill sergeant is telling them, 
you do not have a gun. You have a spear that shoots. Yeah. And he's, you know, and you would basically fire your one shot and then you would fight the rest of the battle with your bayonet. My goodness. And our rule set that we're using for battle, for battle system definitely does, uh, definitely does reflect that as Alex's armies are marching towards me. I'm just mowing them down with my rifle. Um, and even my, my regular muskets. But then mm -hmm. once he gets close enough where he can mount an infantry charge with the British grenadiers and their fixed bayonet, uh, you'd start running because yeah. you're not stopping them. Oh my goodness. That's crazy. And whew, that's, that's really just opened the whole, my, my mind wide open there. Um, this seems so different to what my very limited preconception of the American revolution is being. So you mentioned, obviously, this was a big turning point, Jim. Obviously, this is where the British had one of their first major defeats. So in the grand scheme of things, without going, I know the articles are going to cover this in detail, but just what kind of happened after? What, what kind of made this so impactful? Yeah, the reason why Saratoga is such a turning point is, uh, again, it, the spoilers, uh, the British do lose <laughs> these battles. Um, Burgoyne does get trapped and isn't eventually forced to surrender his whole army. So again, it's almost like a little miniature Stalingrad. Um, this is huge because it's the first British army to be lost in the American Revolution. The British had gotten like, some bloody noses here and there previously, but they were tiny little battles. Battle of Trenton was like a thousand guys. Um, Battle of Prince may have even been smaller. Um, but this is the first time they lost a big, big battle that cost them thousands of people. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly as prisoners, and you know, it's not like we, we killed all these people. Um, but it was the first big loss, like a holy crap, we just lost an entire army. Now, the reason this was important, on top of the regular collateral damage, is that in Paris, we have our ambassador, Ben Franklin. He's the guy on our, on our $100 bill. And he's been trying to get French aid for the American cause since 1776, so maybe even earlier than that. Because there's just no way America can defeat Great Britain in those days. Yeah. It's not even a mouse versus an elephant kind of a, an analogy. It's a mouse versus a herd of elephants. There's just <laughs> no way it's going to happen. Um, but if we can get France into the war on our side, we might have a shot. Um, so every time Ben Franklin and John Adams was over there with him and everything else, were are talking to these French ministers. They can't even get a meeting with the French king, uh, Louis um, Louis the Sixteenth. They can't even get a, a meeting with the French king. Let alone, you know, hey, can we borrow an army? Do you have a navy laying around that you're not using? <laughs> you know, a, a few billion dollars worth of uh, you know munitions and support and supplies. Um, but Saratoga finally turns it around. Saratoga proves that America is a credible cause, and France at last signs the deal. They wow. enter the war in March of 1778. So Saratoga takes place in September, October of 77. It takes three months for that news to get over to Paris because they didn't have, you know, email in those days. <laughs> um, so, and then finally, Ben Franklin was able to get an audience with the king by March of 78. It's really a short period of time when you think about it. Uh, by France, by, by, by March of 78, France is in the war. Spain will soon follow, and even after that, uh, the Netherlands get mixed up in this thing, all against Great Britain. Wow. So, mm. so for Great Britain, what had been this little backwoods internal strife now becomes a global war, and not against a bunch of, you know, country bumpkins out in the woods with their, you know, squirrel rifles. These are against first-class enemies, people with navies, people with banks, people with armies, mm. people with colonies of their own. And for America, victory actually becomes possible. Um, this, this is uh, Saratoga doesn't win the war for us, but it makes victory possible. And uh, eventually, we do win, and the United States is established. You can draw a direct beeline back to Saratoga. None of it is possible without Saratoga. Mm. Everything we're trust me, we're losing everywhere else. Um, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. This wall, while Saratoga is going on, we lose our capital city. Uh, you guys take Philadelphia in October of uh, 77. So you guys are really kicking the crap out of us until Saratoga. Saratoga mm -hmm. makes it all possible. Everything that America has done since the 1800s, you can draw the line, World War I, World War II. Mm -hmm. If Saratoga hadn't happened, there would have been no Normandy. I mean, there would have been no America. You know, it just wouldn't have happened. So that's part of what makes the battle so important. That is, I mm -hmm. never... Never realized just how much could be drawn back to Saratoga. Well, if if I remember correctly, at this time in history, uh, Great Britain was pretty much at the height of its power. Mm. You know, it had been fighting wars Great all Britain, over the place. Yeah. Great Britain was huge. Great mm. Britain had just won hands down the Seven Years' War, mm. along with uh, their allies, the Prussians. Um, the American Revolution gets started. 
uh, all these other allies come in to the American Revolution on the side of the Americans. Uh, although we do win our small part of the American Revolution, the British win everything else. Mm -hmm. The British beat the French in India. They beat the, Fran the, the Spanish in Gibraltar. They beat the hell out of the French all up and down the Caribbean. So a lot of what we were later talk about, the Victorian Empire, um, you know, the, the, the real ascendant, you know, peak of, uh, of the British Empire, a lot of that comes ironically. Um, so, yeah, the, the British lost the American colonies, but they won everything else. They won India uh, uh, from the French. The French and the British were kind of splitting India in those days. This sets up India as a British colony, and, of course, that's a huge part of what's going to mm -hmm. become the Victorian Empire. Absolutely, yeah. It also bankrupts France. France not only loses the war, you know, sorry, France, we know you came to help us out. Uh, <laughs> They wound up picking, a check, picking up the check for that war, and uh, it totally bankrupt. That draws a direct beeline to the French Revolution. That's the fall and decapitation of Louis the Fourteenth. Uh, sorry, Louis the Sixteenth, and, and that gives rise to Napoleon. Mm -hmm. So oh Napoleon Lord. doesn't happen without the American Revolution. And of course, when the British win that series of wars, there's three series of wars: Seven Years' War, the wars that kind of surround the American Revolution, and then the the, uh, the, the Napoleonic Wars. Those three wars, uh, which the British all do win in, in the larger sense, really, I mean, the American Revolution is a British defeat, but it kind of lays a lot of the groundwork. Yeah. Not all of it, but a lot of the groundwork for the really powerful part of British history. Mm. My work. I like playing Risk on a Global Scale. This is just mind blowing. Well, I'm Jim. If it means anything, I'm very happy that we can sit here and talk to you about this openly now. And if you think, I mean, this is only 300 years ago, not even yeah. like not even 300 years ago. And to think of the impact that this had is is, is crazy. So, well, look, I am looking forward to all the articles, Jim. So again, guys out there, there will be five of these articles going through the entire campaign, all the things you can expect that Jim has has just walked through. And all I can say is, is thank you so much, Jim, for coming on the show and, and putting the time and research in. It is. Every time we sit down with you, it's eye-opening, and I, uh, I can't wait to sit and go through them. Cool. Thanks very much. Okay. Well, look, guys, we're going to cut uh, to a quick break here, and then we'll catch you in a moment. Hey, guys, this is Dallas from Private Press, and you're watching The Weekender on Beasts of War. Paint on. That was just a complete eye-opener for me. So yeah. getting to speak to Jim, and one of the big, big things I took away from that was just how those two weeks, with the two battles of Saratoga, really, mm -hmm. they kind of goalposted the whole thing, mm. how that had a knock-on effect on the entire revolution and actually the next kind of 200 years because how those battles turned showed that the Americans could defeat the British yeah. and it meant that the Americans could get support from France, it meant mm -hmm. that Spain could get involved, it led on to just so much more and the two weeks that Jim has chosen to write the articles on is just a starting point mm. but it goes into technical details that I was not aware of. Like we spoke like intimately in, in the interview about the use of muskets mm -hmm. and how the British were winning 90% of the battles mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. And this one period changed everything. Yeah. So for me, it was just, I never realised just how important this period of time was in that revolution. Yeah. And not to mention that, just how inaccurate the musket fire was mm -hmm. as to why they actually had to stand in those big blocks of men. Yeah. Otherwise, you weren't hitting anybody. Yeah, if, for yeah. me, thinking about Napoleonic, so you think about big ranks of men and just firing mm. the gun. But when we, when we jumped to this, and Jim was able to give us so much light onto how much that was not possible in the forests yeah. and fields and yeah. the close guerrilla kind of warfare that mm. happened, it's really nice to read. So there's a couple of articles yeah. out already on this, um, yeah. but there will be a couple more in the series coming on as well. So yeah. um, if you're enjoying them, keep keep reading, keep commenting because it's it's really valuable stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because this of this. I've yeah, actually started. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you go, just. <laughs> no, no, after you. I'm just. Okay, so yeah, um, one of the things that really impressed me reading through the second one, it's actually out this, it came out this week, was some of the amazing heroics and the characters that have been born mm. out of this as well. So it, it really had that feeling of. Amazing. I want to try and play out their, their tactics and the way that they fought on the battlefield at the same time, so. Yeah, just some really cool stuff to get stuck into. I won't spoil it because it's really awesome to read through. But uh, yeah, yeah, cool. don't worry about spoiling it, Ben, because um, <laughs> nobody can hear what the hell you're saying anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no. we're, we're having internet issues, wouldn't you know? <laughs> no, actually, because of this, I've actually started watching Turn on Amazon Prime, which is following the spy network that Washington set up. Now, mm -hmm. it's, I'm not sure if it's fact or fiction, but it's actually really interesting. It doesn't matter, Justin. Yeah. To the likes of me and you, it's uh, all the to same look thing. at that time period. And see some of the things that were that were being done. To actually see battles taking place, and actually seeing how they would have been laid out, 
you know, seeing the cannons, seeing the dragoons, seeing even just the actual uniforms and stuff that they would have wore during the time yeah. period is very, very interesting. Definitely want to check out. Um, uh, the, the, you know, one of the most uh, fascinating uh, things for me was that uh, down near the Mississippi, they packed an alligator full of uh, gunpowder and shot and shot an alligator at them. Right, moving on. <laughs> uh, Jim, Jim, in the comments, please, mate. Were they even near the Mississippi for colonization at that point? I'm confused. Uh, uh, Jim, Jim will back me up on this because it's, it's all based on historical fact coming from one of my favorite songs. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm confused. <laughs> yeah, today I am just confused. <laughs> right. Um, I think it's time for a couple of Kickstarters before we uh, leave you and I go and prepare myself overnight for some Kevin hugging in the morning. Um, right. <coughs> Kicking off, we have War Maidens. And no, I initially read this. This is, uh, there, this is <laughs> Dragon Breads, as in bread, but it's not bread. It's, it's Dragon Breads, as in bread yeah. from a dragon. I would yes. love a so, dragon bread. You know, oh, would dragon, I would the dragon bread be Smoking. amazing. Oh. Fiery hot. Oh, right. Not then that. fill us in with uh, your your war maidens and your dragon breads. Yeah, so uh, this is a Kickstarter coming out of Shield Wolf Miniatures. Uh, they've been doing some awesome stuff in the past for a lot of their fantasy ranges and things yeah. and building up their little world. Uh, and uh, this is them looking to create a whole bunch of awesome new plastic kits for you to use in your fantasy and your sci-fi games. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all to uh, sort of slanted towards the female model, so we've mm -hmm. got a lot of really awesome looking shield mains that can be used and sort of put together with guns as well as swords and shields. Yeah. And you've also got a load of other options for you to use when you're building your armies as a, as a whole. So you can go and pick up some of their existing monsters and things like that from the rest of their range and sort of build up yourself an interesting uh, new collection for whatever you might be playing at the moment in terms of the worlds of science fiction or fantasy. So. Mm -hmm. So we're just having a look through some of the stretch goals and things here at the moment. So we've got mm. the Sister of the Wolves raiding party. Is there any more models as we continue down the page? Oh, look at that. Yeah, Yeah, it's a really interesting mix, this, actually. The, 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 the future tech with the, the old world kind of barbarian look. Mm. It's... It, ben, do both options come in the same box? Is that it? So, like, one box allows you to do... Either a sci-fi option or a fantasy option. Is that is that what I think? I think that is the case. Yeah. So it'll have pretty much everything in the same set, as far as I know. Um, the thing for me that really got me here was where it's like, well, why can't you just try this out and do something interesting in terms of the world of one forty thousand? Like I was thinking, why not do an awesome shield maiden space wolf? Uh, oh, awesome hold up! There are tanks. Yeah, hold up now. <laughs> we we have just found some tanks. What are these yes. about? Yeah, so there's some of the tanks that come as some of the uh, sort of additional stretch goal and add-on option uh, that you can use. And obviously, as you can see here, they're very much towards the sci-fi end of things, as you might imagine. Yeah. Uh, but yes, you can throw them into the mix as well and have them as your sort of heavy support on the tabletop as well. That looks like a Space Wolf. Uh, uh, I like, like Predator. Thing, I'm yes. Yes. No, I'm getting this. Mm. Do you know what this is? This is a, a, an all-female Space Wolf army Begging to be made, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. How cool would and, that be? And if you wanted to make a little bit more fluff right, I guess, you could almost have it as Sisters of Battle, who have actually been fighting with the Sons of Rust for so long that they've almost been ingratiated into mm. their army at mm. the same time. So there you go. That could yeah. work. Hello, Warren. We've got something for you. What have you got? Bear. Oh! Bear. That's not a bear. bear That's a wolf, wolf, man. Chariot. That's got to be a this massive... A wolf bear. Uh, that, no, it's a, a wolf. Uh, do you know what, Justin? I will... Bear wolf. We, it's a bear wolf. <laughs> <laughs> Look at it. Yeah. Oh. Oh, that, that's... Uh, that, do you know what that is? That's a replacement HQ model. Oh, no, no, no. For the, for the space wolf flying chariot thing. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would put my... Who was it that flew around in that? Was it Grim, Grimnar? Grimnar. Grimnar. I'd put my female Grimnar onto the back of that with a pointy sword. So and it, so it's not Grimnar, it's Grimher. <laughs> I don't care. I will come up with a name. But, uh, oh, yes. Nice. Oh, yes. Oh, more this tanks. makes this... Uh, oh, more types what? Of tanks. Nice. Mm -hmm. I'm just I'm scrolling through here. <gasps> war Mammoth! Oh, there's a War Mammoth! War okay, mammoth. everybody stop for a moment. Let's get the face. Let's get the face. Okay. 
a, a war mammoth has to make it in as well. Yep. Oh, Ben, this is I like it. This is do do they have their own game yet, or is this a, something that they're working towards? Uh, they don't have their own game yet. They have their own sort of world that they're building effectively. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of the models that they create, they effectively do them in a sense to support what um, a lot of people call the Ninth Age, which mm-hmm. is like a fan-made Warhammer Fantasy Battles um, yeah. system. So a lot of their sort of stuff that they create has been done in that flow. Um, so sort of you can use it with pretty much whatever you have already in the likes of Kings of War and, and all sorts of things. So. Lower Yetis. Okay. Okay, this is this this is interesting. <laughs> okay, so if you're interested in uh, in that in doing your all female kind of I, I don't know daughters of Russ, wouldn't it be? <laughs> That's um, cool. Uh, Sixteen days left on that mm. one. Right, next one. Uh, there's been a, quite a bit of chatter about this. Mm. It is the everlasting wet palette. <laughs> right, Ben, talk us through it. Okay, so this is by a group called Redgrass Games, mm-hmm. and um, they have created this project which allows you to pick up one of their wet palettes. Now, the thing behind this one is that it's not one of your sort of standard ones, I guess you'd say. This is one that you could use when you're traveling or moving around, or you need to stop when you're, you're painting and then come back to it, because what it does is that it keeps all of the paint that you have on the surface on your wet palette wet constantly. When you come back to Did it. you see that science? That was a really scientific infographic. I liked that a lot. So you've got the water, you've got the foam. Now, I will say there is actually some science behind yeah. this. There, There's potentially going to be a lot more science behind this, but there is a component of it that isn't uh, that isn't available, yeah. that they're working on for some future okay. basis. Yeah, so what that, you have... The principle of osmosis? <laughs> huh? I, uh, compared with photosynthesis, which is Do you know also what, Justin, yeah, in all honesty, I haven't a f- clue. <laughs> but, <laughs> but what I do know is you have a dish, okay? Mm. Um, and in that dish, you put some water. Mm. And in that water, you put some foam. This is not just any foam. This is antibacterial foam. Right. Because you don't want bacterials getting into your paint jobs. Right. Okay? On top of that antibacterial foam... You then put a sheet of hydration paper. Mm. If the stars had been aligned, that would actually have been uh, a, a sheet of what they would have, I think they were calling a hydration membrane, which was a washable membrane. Ah. Uh, but there's still a lot of testing and stuff that they have to go through. So in the meantime, it's a sheet of hydra- hydrational paper. And you get a, you get a number of sheets um, in the actual um, package. Yeah, right. So it's not technically everlasting because you will run out at some point. But we'll forgive them because, you know, the product, the project is being yeah, pitched. It does look way. quite nice. It's just, it's, do you know what? It's a beautiful piece of contemporary mm-hmm. design. Mm-hmm. I'm not finished with the science yet, though, Justin. Okay, back to the science. Okay, because on top of that sheet of, uh, of hydration paper, yeah. okay, you put your paints. Yeah. Okay. And on top of your paint you put? And on top of your paints... You put the lovely orange lid, right. and then what that does is that osmosis is the f- out of it. So it does. You don't understand what the principle of osmosis is, do you? Osmosis was he not the Egyptian god of wetness? No. No. <laughs> right. Whenever, whenever a ship is out to sea for however many months, how do they get fresh water? I don't know. They recycle the piss or something. Don't <laughs> no, they? no. They they use a process called reverse osmosis. Oh, reverse by, osmosis. By which okay. uh, salt. Is removed from the water from the sea to make it drinkable. Mm-hmm. So Can osmosis I... is the fact that water moves through a solid membrane. If I remember correctly, if I'm wrong, yeah. post below. Actually, so I, I, I just, know science. Actually, I just want to be careful on this because if you do drink reverse osmosis water, you will actually run the risk of death. Um, because reverse osmosis not only takes the salt, as far as I'm aware, it, don't, it doesn't only take the salt. Um, out of the water, mm-hmm. right? It takes all of the minerals and impurities and stuff out of the water. And if you drink that kind of water, and um, what it then does is it actually sucks those minerals and stuff like that out of your system, um, which then can leave you depleted in salts and the other minerals that your body actually needs. Fair enough. And apparently, it's quite dangerous. I know this because a few years back. Let me tell you a story. And you're a building few, your apocalypse. A few years back, in, when I was building my bunker. A bunker. <laughs> a, few years, bunk out back. a few years back, I had a go at a different hobby. Okay? And that was the hobby of marine tropical fish. Uh, and I've got to say, it's the worst 
flipping hobby in the world, okay? Because watching your fish die is is not nice, okay? <laughs> but I got this marine tank mm -hmm. uh, in the corner. Myself and Andrea did this as a project shortly after we got together. You know, we were sharing and we got it. And th this is where we met Teddy, the teddy bear crab that crawled out of a rock and scared the crap out of us one night. A big, hairy crab, okay? So what you do is you set up a tank, yeah. you put the water in, and then you introduce what's called live rock. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is rock that is actually pulled from um, marine Reef. reefs and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And it's this live rock that actually is living rock and it cycles the water and, and it, it keeps the water balanced mm -hmm. so that all your little fishies um, love the water. Yeah. Okay, if you didn't have it, they wouldn't love the water and they would die. Yeah. That's science. Yeah. So, <laughs> but it, sometimes in these live rocks, um, you get hitchhikers. And okay. We got a hitchhiker. So while we were cycling this tank up, mm -hmm. at night would out crawl this horrible, hairy crab, right? That big? <laughs> no, it's no, no, it about the size of the palm of your hand. Wow, really? okay. It was quite big. Yeah. Big, horrible mess. But the most horrible thing about him was he was literally furry so he was like a big horrible tarantula in in the bottom of the tank and of course when you're not expecting anything in this tank and you're sitting beside the tank at night next thing you see these swaying claws and you're going what is that what is that i had the willies for about two hours scooting around the house going <laughs> did you not eventually take that back to the pet shop i did I did. We fished out Harry in a pint glass. It was a Guinness glass. That always Never works. used again. So I put in a, a Guinness glass and I left it at an angle and then Harry came out and then slid down because he wanted to try and get the Guinness. And he slid down <laughs> into the bottom of the glass. So we took it back to the shop and I said, look, you have him because I have too much of a case of the willies to have that in my tank. I'm fine with Nemo. I'm fine with Dory, but I don't want that. So he put it in uh, to his um, tank where he kept his corals, mm -hmm. and Harry proceeded to eat his corals. And <laughs> corals cost a lot of money. Which are a lot but of it fish. had nothing to do with me, Gov. Anyway, <laughs> the water that you can put into these things yeah. is called RO water, which mm -hmm. is reverse osmosis water. Yeah. But the idea is you put it in, but you also have to put the nutrients and the salt yeah. and stuff well, like th that back in. This is what Don and Jan are so. having to do a lot at the minute, because they have one of those tanks, and they're always keeping an eye on the balance of the water. Yes, yeah. So it's uh, so I'm not sure about shipmen drinking pure reverse osmosis water. I think they might have to pee in it or something like that there just to just to get all the minerals and stuff and nutrients into it. Anyway, why are we even talking about that? So Ben, uh, this ben Kickstarter. Trying to, um, yes, no. I'm trying to put forward the principle that the water is going through the paper via osmosis. But anyway, yes. Yeah, so when it comes to the Kickstarter, a lot of people have asked, well, why should I have this when I already can just make a wet palette at home? Yes. Uh, Roman actually has been talking about this a couple of times, and he says that he started using one of the P3 um, versions of like a wet palette you can get, and he really, really enjoyed it because it just meant that things lasted for longer, it was easier to set up, he knew what it was doing, it almost sort of got him started when he was doing these kind of things, yeah. kept him regimented. So this might be great for someone who doesn't really want to go through a lot of the faff for it, and they just want something that is very easy and you know simple to pick up and put together. So yeah, there are some benefits to this, there's obviously some drawbacks as well, uh, but it's something you might, might want to go and check out. It's gone very well on Kickstarter. So. Well, uh, I want to point out some of, the, some of the benefits of why you might go for yeah. this. Firstly, it looks awesome. It does, yeah. You know, it's a beautiful piece of contemporary design. I also like the fact that it has, they've thought ahead and put done the little magnetic things. Yeah. Mm. So you can add an additional kind of mm -hmm. um, uh, traditional palettes and stuff like that to it. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there'll be other accessories and things mm -hmm. like that that'll come up. Mm -hmm. Secondly, is this uh, TPE seal that they've come up with, all right? Basically, it's like a Tupperware seal, yeah. okay? But this is the kind of thing that, if you're into your painting, mm -hmm. you like having your stuff be cool, you know? <laughs> uh, you know, if, if you're going around to, to places and do painting, sometimes it's nice to have a nice built-for-purpose kind of a tool you for doing You just to pull it. something out of your bag and yeah, have people go, ooh, yeah, look at that. There, okay, so you, you sit down. Do you know what? It takes us right back to school days whenever uh, all your mates had the big fancy basketball boots <laughs> and, and we had cheap gutties, yeah. okay? Gutties. This, is, this is fancy battle basketball boots, right? This is the kind of thing that will make you feel better about your painting yeah. 
and it does actually mm -hmm. work. It's it's a great uh, a yeah. great wet palette, but it's one that'll make you go, yeah, that's kind of cool. Otherwise, you're picking out your big ass yeah. Tupperware thing, um, and it's all flopping around and everything else. So I'm not gonna lie, things. right? If you're someone who like actually likes to mix their paints and takes a long time over their paint, yeah. If you get a particular mix of paint that you or paint that you're quite happy with, you can actually close this up, set it to the side, and come back to it a bit later. Instead of having to come back to it and go, crap, I need to remember how I mix that color. Absolutely. It, uh, being a wet palette, it will keep your paints active for longer. Yes, so, with this having yes. the hermetic seal to it, that will maybe increase that time. Those hermetics, it makes all the difference. I couldn't agree more. Give me more hermetics. Did they get enough hermetics <laughs> into it? For me, right? Yes. The thing I like most about it. Is Let me guess. Go on. Hermetics, yes? Yeah, damn. Why? Why? <laughs> if you're going you to steal my point from me. No. I it's, knew it. Um, this is going to sound a bit strange because I'm getting, I'm new to painting. Yes. I'm getting used to it. I'm trying to find my position, how I like to do it. And at the minute, I don't have a painting station. Yeah. I only paint really in Hobby Night Live. Yes. And we paint with paper plates. Yes. Or dinner plates with a sponge yep. in and a wet palette on top and a, and a sheet on top, which is okay. Yes. But if I wanted to go home and maybe paint on the sofa while mm -hmm. watching something in TV, yep. that would probably grip quite nicely on like the arm of a chair. And it's not it's a play. It's, I actually like the fact that I could be in my room on my computer, maybe doing some painting, watch something at the desk, but then actually go, do you know what? I'm just going to take my painting station with me and put a little water in the little side tray if I need to, just to have a little bit, just to clean the brush off lightly and sit on the sofa comfortably and do that. Or if I want to sit cross legged on my bed, it's just for me, the design of it is actually the winner. The wet, we know what a wet palette is. Yes. No one's going to, who, who is actually going to be like, I'm leaving the house? And I'm away on a six hour journey. I'm going to moisten my palette so it doesn't dry out. Actually, hold on, correct myself. On the train, how good would that be? Yep. That would be great yep. if you knew. There's, uh, there is some aspects to this as mm. well. It, because it's low rise. Yep. You see, the thing is, I don't know about transporting paints in this. Yeah, your paints are never going to be in it. Because it, you're, you're, you're. No, that's you're, never going to be. going to flop thing. around. But. But it's, it's guaranteed moist for a long time. Yes. So if you're on a mm. tube for an hour and then you hop yeah. on a train for a four hour journey, your moisture is going to last until you're... So in. the mo if it keeps it moist, that's good. But if it's flopping around all over the place, yeah. that's not going to be yeah. so good. The other thing is you could use either end, right? And that's yeah. always, a, uh, always a thing. So you could have so double the amount of wetness. This? Yes, doing it like that. Twice the size, double but, the fun. Yep. Yeah. Now up, up. This is the bit here, low rise. Uh, because the other, the other option, if you look in something that's hermetically sealed, mm. a, a Tupperware. Yeah. But Tupperware is going to be too mm. high. Okay. The Tupperware is like a plastic yeah. lock and lock or yeah. something like that there. Yeah. Whereas this um, is, is low rise, so it's easy to dip your brush mm -hmm. in it because you don't want to be sitting going like that there. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, come on. It's I, a, I'm it's, more it's forward a, than I thought I would be. It's a designer's. Wet palette. It, it appeals. Yeah. It appeals yeah. to. It appeals to the, those of us that are looking at it going. Yeah, I, I fancy. I fancy getting a, a fancier wet palette. Yeah. So, but you know, <laughs> other than the, the wet palette, I am interested to see where they go with the membrane because I, I think I think that is going to Could be a be very real. interesting piece of science ISP. when it comes yeah. along. But uh, in the meantime, if you're after a fancy wet palette, that's the one to go for. I will and it's say, got 19 days left. The price point on this isn't bad. To actually get yourself in, it's only like 25 euros. Yeah. That's pretty cheap to get yourself in. Yep, yep. that is pretty cheap to get yourself in. Yeah. So, and plenty of hermetics spilling out. Yeah. Brilliant. Right, we're done. Ben, thank you. <laughs> Justin, thank you. And us especially thank you, man. <laughs> so, we are done. Um, remember to uh, join us in the morning for Kevin Tugging. <laughs> and I'm sure there'll be something else in the show other than Kevin Tugging, but we'll get started with that. Um, thank you very much for watching. And we will see you next week. Remember, get stuck into that bulls uh, bull song, bull song competition. <laughs> Win yourself some goodies. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And be sure to check out beastsofwar.com for the latest gaming news and gaming let's plays. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.